Crystal Ear stuff. This is kind of what? Is that kind of a week on? Yeah, it's been a week on since? Yeah, it's been more than a week. It's been two weeks since the infamous Crystal Ear documentary dropped. And this is kind of a bit of a you know, review of what's basically happened since then. Nothing really, isn't it? That's the really unfortunate part of this whole situation, I feel like. Watching it from the outside in, also being somebody who kind of came into the accusations thinking that it was mostly just Chris just being too horny. Because I think my original impression of the allegations against Chris was that most of the reason why he was getting cancelled and why these girls were coming after him was because he was just a douche. Like, he didn't go out of his way to make the experience or the hookup, however crass it was, enjoyable. Because I remember reading one account of when he met some girl and he just, you know, didn't really talk to her and kind of just took her upstairs and tried to get on with her straight away. There was no pre-game. There was no foreplay. There was nothing. He just went straight from outside, took her upstairs like a like a lady of the night and tried to do his business. So of course, the girl wasn't too infused by it and maybe denied his advances. But I thought, okay, cool. He's clearly somebody that's aggressively horny and maybe somebody that doesn't necessarily, you know, view women that he has any sort of sexual relationship with as any, have any, any kind of value. It's sort of transactional. But then when you watch the documentary, you realize it's far more sinister, far more dark, far more even bordering on a level of evil than you would have, you know, expected if you just read the original allegations. And you think to yourself, rah, Ted, boy, this is mad. But then when you really think about it and you think about it in the context of council culture in general, you think about it, what's happened prior with all these other essay allegations with people. And you think about what's going on nowadays now, especially when you think of content creators and podcasters and people that have patrons and whatnot that get involved in these scandals the truth of the matter is council culture doesn't necessarily work with people like this it just doesn't because what you want with council culture you want someone to feel shame embarrassed for what they did right um but if you're a bit of a scumbag and you have fans who are okay with you being a scumbag it's very difficult to feel embarrassed or shameful for what you did because your fans don't care and if your fans don't care, they're the ones that pay your bills, they're the ones that you're creating the content for, it's very difficult if you're a victim of the things that Chris has been accused of to feel as if you're going to get any level of justice societally. Because I've, I thought for me for the longest time, I felt like cancel culture wasn't necessarily an attempt for women, or even me too, wasn't necessarily, it didn't feel like an attempt for women to try and get these guys locked up. Because we all know um, anything involving sexual abuse is really hard to convict in court for some reason especially the r word it's just always always difficult to actually get people convicted for it um so for the most part a lot of this stuff that happens to women out there just doesn't get reported it kind of falls by the wayside and you're left with you know hundreds of thousands if not millions of victims out there who have never spoken about what has happened to them because i know it's not going to go anywhere so you look at me too and, and you know and council culture sort of movement and whatnot and even though it got a bit out of hand towards the end the original I thought kind of reason for it was to kind of hold people accountable and say hey you did this thing to me like say it aloud like you did this to me I remember it I know it happened and kind of put it out there in public so that it doesn't happen again and kind of make people embarrassed because what cancer culture and me too did is that it exposed everybody involved because I think that's the main thing I got from the Harvey Weinstein documentaries and exposés about it the Harvey Weinstein thing, it, obviously Harvey Weinstein was a monster, but what you also got from it was the amount of enablers and unfortunately so the amount of women around him that who enabled and facilitated some of his, you know, disgusting and horrible acts that he obviously is rightfully been uh, charged with um, and probably going to spend a lot of time in prison off the back of. All those things happen and that's what happens, right? But you don't necessarily see a lot of these guys ending up in jail, unfortunately. So, even though the documentary was well done, even though it painted the picture of Chris that isn't favourable, and I think for the general decent everyday person out there, it's hard to root for the guy. It's basically impossible to root for him. In the grand scheme of things, will it really change the course of his career now? Not really. Because he was never going to get Welcome Back into Hollywood. Hollywood journey is done. He's never going to get a Netflix special again. I don't think so. Um, but he's probably going to have a decent career with his podcast right he's still able to pull decent numbers of his fucking brother who no one knows right 
He's got a podcast with his brother that he's doing. That's already, uh, you know, near 40k. Again, it's only 40k views, not a lot, but still, you know, it's, it accumulates after a while. Um, I don't know. I just, I just don't think it's, it's like, uh, there's, there's a resolution that's favorable for anybody involved personally. It doesn't do anything for anybody. For any, for the victims, they have to relive the trauma of the events. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It, for it, like, and the other thing that's also interesting about it while I was viewing from afar was the complete silence, complete silence from guys in the comedy community about it. I thought that was really interesting. And more so with guys in the comedy community who have daughters who are around the same age as uh, the girls that Chris is alleged to be into, just having absolutely nothing to say. Now, is this professional courtesy because he's involved in your industry and you don't want to put him out there that way? I don't really know. But I find the fact that none of these big-time comics have come out and said anything about it. I know there's been a few. I think there's been a couple. Maybe Nikki Glazer said some stuff. A Legion of Skanks have kind of made some comments. But no one from his kind of circle of friends have really said anything about it. They've all kind of kept their mouths stum, which is pretty crazy. In my opinion, oh, I did that wrong. Um, yeah, it's pretty nuts. In my opinion, I don't know. I just, uh, I just don't understand how this guy has been able to get away with this. But, but a lot of a lot of it, I think, comes to my original summation before that I said was this. Same as what happened with Kalila and stuff with the Bobby Lee things with Brendan Sharp. There wasn't, I don't think, there wasn't enough conversation or a lot of kickback or pushback on Brendan when it comes to the, what I thought was the most egregious crime, which was trying to smash, you know, your comedic friend's girlfriend at the time behind his back. I thought that was worse than him accusing Bobby Leo being the culprit behind the flipping homeless cats on subreddit, right? Being a subreddit flipping guy. I thought that was worse, right? Him trying to actually fuck Kalila. Uh, but you know, no one seemed to bat an eyelid at that and I remember my kind of when I figured out you know I was like you know what maybe no one's really talking about that because everybody's everybody does it themselves they've either tried to fuck Lila themselves or they've done it to other comics like they've smashed their partners their wives their their dates whatever behind their back like it's something that everyone does in the scene so they can't exactly come out and condemn him because they also do that or far worse so maybe it's the case with this Crystalia thing, which is scary to think. This is scary. Think about this. Maybe there are others in the comedy community who have done similar things to Crystalia, so they don't feel like they have a, a right to come out and chastise them about it also, which is really sick and really crazy. But again, man, that LA delusion, that LA scene is just wild. The things you can get away with as a grown-up you can get away with some and these people aren't even that well-known household names maybe chris lear is because he was really famous and he was in a hit tv show but for the most part you'd imagine most comedians aren't that well known outside of the ones that get on jre they're just like regular dudes and regular gals and they're able to get away with this level of debauchery and this level of abuse just imagine what the big people are getting up to just imagine you know, a little bit of clout, a little bit of celebrity. You're getting people in your DMs hitting you up or you're reaching out to people. You're searching your names. The conversations are flowing a little bit easier. You're able to kind of get through on second, third base. Like, I don't know. It's scary. It's scary. But again, it's disappointing because I feel like I don't know what people were expecting from it. Maybe they were expecting Chris to be let out in cuffs somewhere. That was never going to happen. Um, you know, he kind of kept on keeping on when the pod dropped. He went out. Um, I think he kept doing the pod. He did one of his wife, I think, straight after. Uh, the the final kid didn't really make a comment on it. And people just kept on keeping on. The one who got caught astray, though, was Eric Griffin. I saw Eric Griffin randomly caught astray. I forgot where I saw it, but I saw someone posting, I think a comment, maybe it was Alice Hamilton, or somebody posted somebody's comment where they said something like, oh yeah, Eric Griffin was also hitting me up when I was this age, knowing full well what age I was, which might also explain why he was kind of cucking 
and you know white knighting for chris you know when that whole thing was going down and whatnot and you know stumbling over his words and trying to explain things and whatnot that that probably explains a lot of it but i can't really think of anything else that's happened that's been any sort of impact in his career when it comes to chris overall he's kind of probably ride this out he's going to be completely fine unfortunately so when it when it comes to those documentaries I think people just do this because, you know, you want to share your story, you want to get it out there. And I think the good thing about those docs is that what you hope would happen is that you warn other people. It's just like, that's what you do. It's a warning. You put it out in public because I've said it before prior, but I think a large part of the reason why Chris ran away, right? What's also? Dave Page, Chris has more experience with black male than (laughs) QK. Uh, this chat you guys are you guys, you guys are going to hell um, I said from a time ago one of the reasons why I think Chris went dark for so long and disappeared and didn't want to talk or anything I felt like was the sort of like the embarrassment and the shame of being exposed of being a sex pest and being horny because that was never his image he was, don't get me wrong, he had the whole like first traffic with his top off, but I always thought it was more comedic than it was like, hey, I'm sexy. Obviously, he had a big female audience and a big fan base. I remember seeing at a Laugh Factory thinking, wow, I've, you know, I, I didn't know that many girls came out to comedy shows. And then lo and behold, Chris Lear comes out on stage and he gets the biggest applause. You're like, oh, they're here for him. But I never got the impression that he was being overly sexual with his videos online. He was just trying to, I felt like I was trying to be funny and doing what most white guys do when they're trying to be funny is that they either put on women's clothing, they take off their own clothes or they make weird voices. And, you know, he did, you know, two out of the three. Um, but obviously when those allegations came out and people got to see his deepest, darkest kinks, it was a bit of a shock because it went against everything that we know of him to be. So that's why he probably disappeared for so long. But when he came back and saw that the only thing he lost was a couple of Hollywood deals and a Netflix special and maybe, you know, again, you know, commercial endorsements, he was like, it's not too bad. I've got a popping Patreon. I'd get some decent AdSense money from my YouTube. I do get booked in shows. I sell out. I remember seeing the other day on my, on my stream, we looked up around the tickets this guy actually sells and it's a lot. It's unfortunate, man, but I think the only, the only reason why you come out and speak out as issues is because you want to raise awareness and make sure other girls don't end up in the same position that you did. But I don't think you can ever expect him to be, you know, be in prison anywhere, shape or form, anywhere, anytime soon. It's not going to happen, unfortunately. So it is what it is. And to be honest with what I've seen so far, again, unless this is my thinking, unless he, his team of people, unless he's got a BJ on his team who's actively going through and deleting comments, there's been so many supportive comments on his stuff on YouTube. It seems like his fans really don't care. Like, for the most part, they don't care at all, in the slightest. So, that's interesting to see. Not gonna lie, that's been really, really interesting to see. His fans don't give an absolute scoob 